intended to be sort of a workshop, so if anyone wants to, at the, like, sort of halfway through, um, we'll be doing some coding if anyone wants to uh, take out their laptop and, you know, try some stuff out. Uh, if not, no worries. Um, uh, but yeah. So um, this, the workshop overview, um, the introduction is just a little bit of background on NFTs um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with them. Um, a little bit of background on OpenSea. Um, and then the second part of the, the presentation will be the development goal of you know, deploying a tradable NFT conference ticket um, with the sub goals of implementing a simple ERC721 contract uh, viewing the tickets on the marketplace, putting them on sale, and then maybe as a take-home task, programmatically selling the tickets uh, using something like the OpenSea SDK. So how many of you are familiar with ERC721? Okay, so it's the majority of the room. Um, so this is probably just a refresher, but um, you know, ERC20 are, represents what are called fungible assets, so currencies, and ERC721 was designed to represent unique or non-fungible digital assets, so each one was associated with a unique identifier, and the space of, uh, or one of the reasons we're excited about non-fungible assets is we actually think that the number of currencies that individuals will use on a day-to-day -day basis um, you know, is limited to maybe stable coins, um, maybe in-game currencies, things like this, but the number of digital assets that we already use on a day-to-day -day basis is very wide. So, you know, things like game items, things like domain names, things like event tickets, and then when you start connecting these digital assets to the uh, real world, you have you know, things like real estate or physical items as well that could be represented using this standard. So a little bit of history of ERC721. Um, so in 2017, has anyone heard of CryptoPunks? Okay, so most people. So CryptoPunks was sort of the first non-fungible asset on Ethereum. There were non-fungible assets uh, using Bitcoin counterparty, um, but it was sort of the first one um, that you know was the idea of a crypto collectible on Ethereum. But there was no standard around it. Um, and what CryptoKitties did was, number one, they built a game around these assets, but they also uh, pioneered the ERC721 standard, which was sort of refined by the Ethereum community such that it could be leveraged by other projects. Um, so one of those early projects was a project called Decentraland, which represented their virtual land using the ERC721 standard. That was in like, late 2017. Um, in early 2018, we sort of had a miniature craze around uh, non-fungible tokens that was a lot more isolated to the early adopter tech enthusiasts than you know relative to the craze that we saw around ICOs and ERC20s. Um, but there were a lot of uh, CryptoKitty clones, like CryptoBots, CryptoFighters, um, and there were also these uh, games called Hot Potato Games, which were um, kind of these games where you would buy a collectible with the intention of selling it at a higher price. So it's kind of this, you know, even more experimental period than we're going through right now um, with, you know, a lot of um, scammy projects as well. In mid-2018, um, we started seeing higher quality projects enter the space. Um, so the two right there, and, and there were a lot, um, are Gods Unchained, which is a trading card game that used ERC721 to represent their assets, um, and then MLB Crypto, which was actually an officially licensed game from the MLB um, that, that had these uh, crypto collectibles associated with them. And that brings us to 2019, where um, actually, you know, it's less of a well-known space in the uh, crypto sphere, but there's actually quite a lot of activity happening in the NFT space right now. So. So um, Formula One recently auctioned off some cars um, using our marketplace actually. Uh, there's a couple Japanese games that are becoming really popular. There's a space game um, that 
is, is kind of like EVE Online, if anyone's played that. And then there are starting to be um, assets that are not in just collectibles and gaming. So ENS is one of those uh, that is using the ERC-721 standard to allow uh, their names to be tradable. So um, one question one might ask is like, why, why is gaming kind of the leader here? Um, so why is this a, an interesting fit for gaming? Um, number one, I think gaming is often like a digital, uh, sort of a playground for a new technology. Um, we saw this with the mobile phone. Um, we saw this with the early internet. Um, but you know, the the shift in gaming that you know folks are excited about is this idea that as a game developer you sort of manage every piece of your economy. Um, you manage the supply of your items, you usually don't allow other items to be imported into your game, um, there's nothing really exported from the game, it's sort of this um, highly controlled isolationist economy. Um, and what's exciting is that with blockchains and um, digital ownership you could have an open economy where you know, you could export things from the game, you could trade them on open marketplaces, you could do all these interesting things. Um, and so this is kind of the, the shift that people are excited about in, in the gaming community. So a little background on OpenSea. Um, so OpenSea is a marketplace for all of these uh, items. So starting with ERC721, um, but we recently did add support for a new standard called 1155. Um, we have around 700,000 monthly volume, so you know, on the lower side of uh, decentralized exchanges, but um, you know, this is volume that people, have, this is actual um, unique digital assets that are being traded, it's not just um, token, which there is a, a lot of wash trading for. Um, we also provide an API. This is more of a convenience uh, for wallets that are trying to show ERC-721 items. So this is used by Coinbase Wallet, Trust Wallet, Opera, and maybe 20 other different wallets all use our API. Um, and then we partner with a lot of games to build customized uh, white labeled marketplaces. So this is kind of what OpenSea looks like. Uh, the moment you have an ERC721 item, you can put it on sale. It's kind of like eBay. Um, trades are wallet to wallet. Um, so they, they never leave your account, they're never escrowed. And we also provide uh, a lot of the functionality that eBay provides for digital assets. So this is the Formula One car. You can see it was actually last sold for 450 Ether. I think this is a record sale um, in the NFT community. And uh, you know, basically we provide an interface for allowing people to do eBay style auctions for these items. So um, if, if you were to build your own marketplace on OpenSea, uh, essentially what you get out of the box is all of the functionality that's built into the OpenSea website, uh, every single OpenSea feature, uh, you can customize it, um, and I'll, actually I'll talk about some of these other features. Um, so this is what it looks like for this game, uh, Crypto Space Commanders. You have this browsable view of your items. Um, you can add rich metadata to them to kind of uh, control how they're displayed on the marketplace. Um, and then the most important uh, element of this model is that uh, we allow the developer of an NFT to take a cut of every secondary sale on their marketplace. So our model right now is transaction fee based that might change in the future, um, but we think that there should be an incentive for developers to promote their marketplace. We also provide uh, a toolkit for which we'll talk a little bit um, about in the workshop piece um, for programmatically creating marketplaces. So this is a marketplace created by Ethereum, which is a trading card game, um, and you can see that the marketplace that they've created and the OpenSea marketplace are actually synchronized, such that every sale or every auction that happens on their marketplace also uh, happens on OpenSea. It shares the same contracts and the same order books. So a couple um, examples of interesting NFT projects to kind of make some of this a little more concrete. So this is a project called CryptoVoxels. Uh, who here has heard of CryptoVoxels? Okay, so not, not that many people. Um, so CryptoVoxels is a virtual world 
where the land is represented as ERC721 NFTs. And uh, it actually just started as one developer, and he just started selling this virtual land. He sold it at a pretty low price. Um, and when you own this land, it's kind of like Minecraft. You could build things on top of it. So here, uh, the other interesting thing the developer did was he allowed you to pull in your assets into this virtual world. So um, this is a CryptoKitties museum inside of CryptoVoxels uh, where you could actually go and, and purchase these CryptoKitties inside of the virtual world. Um, so I'll do a quick demo. So um, one, one interesting that, thing that has happened is there are now folks who are curators of uh, digital collectibles and um, they have started uh, creating galleries in crypto voxels to explore these, uh, these artworks. So this is a gallery from um, someone you know, who basically thinks of themselves as a digital art curator um, and has sort of created this, this museum. Um, another interesting NFT project was uh, CryptoStamp. So CryptoStamp is uh, an interesting one because it was actually coupled to a physical uh, stamp. So the Austrian Postal Service um, basically created this line of collectible stamps where if you purchase one, you would not only get a real usable stamp, you know, a lot of people probably don't use those these days, but you would get a stamp, and then you'd also get a crypto collectible that you could trade on an open marketplace. Um, and this was kind of an interesting way to engage an existing community of stamp collectors in digital assets. Um, and we think we'll see a lot of that kind of tethering uh, these uh, virtual assets to a real life physical asset. Um, and then, of course, uh, the most recent one is the ENS project. So ENS is a name system for Ethereum, so you can think of it kind of like dot coms. Um, and right now, these assets are tradable as ERC-721s. Most recently, we collaborated with the ENS team on doing the auctions for their short name um, names. So these were basically names like set.eth that uh, were reserved for uh, an auction system um, that'll, that is actually currently taking place right now. All right, so I guess any questions um, about NFTs or ERC721 before I hop into the workshop part? Is there a conference about NFTs? NFT.nyc. When is it? February 20th? Yep. Are you, how, what's the growth coming up you've seen yeah. in this area? So um, the initial spike in usage of NFTs was CryptoKitties. And you, know, you probably remember these cats selling for like $50,000 each. Um, and nothing has you know, risen to that level of uh, market volume, but I think that was, you know, to some extent, an anomaly. Um, in terms of market volume growth, it's sort of slow but steady linear growth at the moment. So we're seeing, um, we're seeing high growth in the number of projects that enter the space. We're seeing sort of gradual growth in the number of users that are trying them out. So it's a lot of the same early adopter type folks um, who are like kind of trying these out and. Yeah, you know, there's a variety of reasons that's the case. Like usability, scalability, all of those. Is it, is it gaming or is it? I mean, yeah, it's all in gaming, pretty much. Is the, is the art? Is that? Oh, the art. Um, it, it's also interesting, um, but still pretty small. Um, I think like for art, the biggest thing is having a place to display the art. So projects like Crypto Voxels and Decentraland kind of add that utility to the art. But there are there are a number of crypto artists who um, have sold works for you know five to ten ETH because they have such a you know, solid reputation in the space. Um, so it is starting to be interesting. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there tools for integrating composable NFTs and like trading held assets? Yeah, so there was a standard called ERC-998 that did that. Um, I'm not aware of any like, easy to use tools that allow you to like bundle, well, so we have bundles, which basically allow you to sell a bunch of NFTs at the same time, but that's a little bit different. Um, I don't know of any websites at the moment that are making it really easy to like compose NFTs together, um, but it would be an interesting project. Yeah. Uh, what do you think needs to happen before we can see like multiple of the current growth? Before we see before growth? Before we see high growth of this like, volume transaction mm. um, on this open market? Yeah. Um, that's like a common question, I think, for, for everyone. And, or, you know, it's asked at like nearly every panel. Well, specifically for <laughs> NFT then? Um, yeah, for NFTs, I think um, maybe a couple different axes. So, one is quality of the games, which is steadily growing, but the life cycle or the development time of the game is actually you know, typically pretty long. Um, so I think the quality of the experiences have to be high enough for people to want to use them. And right now they're just they're getting there, but they're not quite there. Um, and then uh, use just usability of the network in general. So things you know, better wallets, uh, um, you know, potentially better blockchains for people to build these assets on, that type of stuff. So what's prevent, preventing existing or high quality game to move toward the blockchain? Um, I think the main thing preventing them is, well I guess a couple things. One is I think it's kind of tricky to for an existing game to just move their assets to the blockchain, right? Um, especially if it was a really big game and they wanted the same user experience, you know, they could hide away all the Ethereum stuff, but then, you know, they're just basically, basically using a really expensive database for their game. Um, so I think it, I think the games that are most effective have to be new games. And those new games suffer from the, like, onboarding experience of getting Ether. Some, some hide it, um, but then, you know, they, they use everything, and then they're kind of competing with every other game. Um, but if they leverage the blockchain in an interesting way, then um, you know there are some like really interesting user benefits, like trading on open marketplaces, using them in the virtual world, that type of stuff. Yeah. Are we seeing any adoption from uh, virtual reality mainstays or augmented reality um, producers? Not just the games, but maybe even like interest from the manufacturers of the headsets and such. I'm not sure. Yeah. I uh, other than the virtual reality projects, I'm not. I'm not sure. How, how do you think about like uh, the kind of global scarcity of these NFTs? Because it, it seems to be like one property that they have is that they're they're unique individually, mm -hmm. but kind of collectively they dilute each other because unlike collectibles in the real world, where there's this kind of like minimal cost of, of production, yeah. you know, it's really easy for lots of people to start creating these, and, and they all just end up kind of diluting each other. So where, where does where do you think the value is of growing? Is it like around the utility of the NFT? Because you can't kind of fake that, or are, are there brands like that one? I think yeah, um, utility and provenance, uh, and maybe some other things. But uh, so utility of the NFT in a game, right? So um, you know if you can just if you can the same as like Fortnite, right? If you can wear a legendary or a, a well-known skin, you know that's cool, and you can show it off. Uh, so that's sort of utility. Um, and then provenance is like oh this was the officially endorsed Disney collectible and hence and like Disney has sanction, has said this is the smart contract we're using there will only be this number of them I think that it, kind of with the Austrian Postal Service right not a huge brand but um, you know they basically said this is the official crypto stamp for the Austrian Postal Service there's only five like red stamps hence those might be valuable for collectors have, have you seen anyone trying to create like a, a kind of art uh, import scarcity via like having to burn some other asset to use anyone trying that? Yeah, so there have been a lot of like swap your crypto kitty or burn your crypto kitty to receive uh, crypto I think it was like crypto strikers that did this. Um, so that is a real that's a really good point. I think a very interesting way to um, to engage the existing community is to leverage like the existing set of NFTs, right? So go to CryptoKitties and say, oh, now they're useful in this other game, or you know, you can trade them in for our game asset that's better or something like that. Um, 
uh, yeah, and then there's there's also like NFT airdrops now, so people will like airdrop a promotional NFT in your account. So there's like tons of things you could do. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yep. Have you seen much? Um, have you seen anybody kind of use NFTs as a like, permission based system? Like I have this asset, so therefore I have the rights to do this. Yeah. So there's the unlock protocol, uh, which is. Um, basically, sort of a subscription service um, that you, you buy an NFT and then you get access to content or something like that. So that's kind of what they're going after is they're talking to publishers and saying, um, give us this for that. Uh, also, a, a DevCon ticket sold on, an, on OpenSea for 7 ETH the other day. Um, so tickets are kind of a permissioning system, right? Um, so there's, there's stuff like that. All right, so now digging into the nitty gritty. Um, so if anyone has their laptop, they can follow along. If not, um, just watch me do stuff. So uh, this is the ERC721 interface. Um, it's basically a, a lot like ERC20, um, except that uh, the key method is sort of this owner of token ID. Right, so the token ID you can think of as, for example, like an individual crypto kitty would have a token ID of, of something. And to check who owns that crypto kitty, you call owner of. Um, and then uh, maybe some of you are familiar with the idea of approve um, in ERC20, but basically this is a way for uh, an individual to say, I approve this account to transfer my item. Um, so for exchanges, this is very useful because you can approve um, OpenSea, or actually a proxy, but um, that's kind of a, de a detail, uh, to transfer your items uh, in the event of a sale so that they don't have to actually leave your wallet while they're on sale. Um, and then this transfer from is obviously a really key one. This is basically the ability to transfer a CryptoKitty or what have you from an address to another address. Then the kind of interesting, or very interesting uh, part of ERC721 is, you know, you have these token IDs, but how do you actually <coughs> represent, uh, you know, what a CryptoKitty is, which is, you know, has a name, it has an image, it has a description, it has maybe some traits. So where does that live? Um, and at the moment, all of that lives off chain. Um, I don't think there's, can't think of a single ERC721 that has put um, a lot of data on chain. There are 721s that put some data on chain, but most have some off chain component. And so that's where this token URI comes into play. So, the token URI uh, is basically um, a way for the ERC721 developer to say, uh, this is where you can grab all the data for my item. So this takes in a token ID and returns a URL. So here's um, an example of some data that would be returned from the URL when you hit it that uh, represents the asset. So this is, what, this is actually one of our test assets uh, called an OpenSea creature. And uh, you can see it has a description, a image, a name, um, an external URL, and these all map to uh, this item, right? So you can see the, um, the image, uh, this view on OpenSea creature is basically the external URL that you would kind of click into. Um, and then it has these properties, which uh, this is kind of an addition that OpenSea uh, made up to allow you to add a little more rich data to your, to your items. But what's cool is that, you know, as long as you implement the token URI and uh, you've Form to the ERC 721 standard, you kind of get it all for free, um, and as you can see, like this is automatically tradable, all that stuff because it is the ERC 721. And then um, what the other interesting thing is, this is also what is allowing for limited degrees of interoperability. So this is um, that same uh, OpenSea creature inside of uh, that crypto voxels game that I was mentioning, right? So. Um, now, because that metadata is standardized, um, CryptoVoxel or whatever site can go and pull it or use the OpenSea API, which makes it a little more convenient. 
um, to grab this asset and display it in the virtual world. Uh, and uh, Etherscan as well has actually recently just started uh, listing all the inventory of ERC-721s, which I think is, a, is an interesting sign that these are sort of starting to achieve the same level of uh, significance as ERC-20, which you know has had a nice ether scan interface for a while. Yep. Did, did uh, CryptoVox need any kind of permission or anything to grab and display it? Is there any any kind of control over who can look at it? Um, I understand they don't own it, but... Right. Uh, so uh, they did not need permission to like check who the owner of that NFT is. They didn't need permission to call the API to get the data. Um, in CryptoVoxel's case, they use our API as like kind of a convenience thing. We, we kind of aggregate some data nicely. Uh, but yeah, no, they don't need any permission. Yep. Can that metadata be changed by anyone? It's just the URI. It's right. Like by third party file. Yeah, um, so we'll see if I get to the work sh or the coding part of this that uh, it can be changed depend depending on where it's hosted. So if you host it on an HTTP server, it, you know, you can certainly change it. Um, there's not really a good standard around like, you know, the metadata changing and then everything updating, kind of just like whole. Um, but if you post it on a, some like decentralized, uh, immutable file storage thing, then you know, obviously. Yeah. Yep. I have a question about the mechanism used to approve um, mm -hmm. the Yeah, so you could, uh, well, so before it gets sold, can you transfer it? Um, it could it be possible for something to be sold um, to someone who doesn't think they're buying something, but you actually transferred it out of the wall? Oh, yeah, so, um, like, if I put a sale up on OpenSea, for example, that says I'm going to sell this, but then I, but then I transfer it somewhere else, then, um, that sale will be kind of canceled by us, or, or like we'll keep track of like, is this sale valid? And then there's the, maybe the more, uh, more of an attack is like transferring it right before it gets bought. Um, so in that case, like the, the sale transaction would fail, right? Because it would try to transfer something that no longer is in that account. Um, so there, it's an atomic swap, right? So there's no sort of scenario where like in the middle of the sale transaction, something gets transferred because this is like, you know, it's blockchain, right? So, yeah. Um, oh, time is up there, cool. So, did the token metadata? Yeah, so if anyone wants to try out deploying an ERC-721 contract, I made a uh, starter repo that forks our um, basic, like, you know, demo repo. Um, for folks who are non-technical, uh, we we also have a, uh, there's plenty, there's tons of ways to mint NFTs, um, which I encourage you to recommend, or encourage you to try out. Um, so one example here is um, uh, our Rinkaby um, instance of OpenSea, which is basically kind of a, a playground for creating NFTs. Um, you can go in our storefront manager and like, you know, actually deploy a new contract um, and then mint NFTs. There's also Mintbase, I think I saw it in the video. <laughs> Mintbase, which is a much better tool for uh, deploying. You gotta work on your SEO. Yeah, and then Mintbase <laughs> IO, it's right there. Down, four, okay. one, two, three, yep. Yeah. Uh, so Mintbase is like a, a much more feature rich way of deploying interesting NFTs. Um, our storefront manager, just like kind of, uh, this is one that I was deploying earlier this morning, um, but you know, I'm pretending that these are the tickets for NFT NYC. Um, and uh, you guys, for the non-technical folks, uh, you can go to the develop menu, storefront manager, and sort of go through the process with, uh, with MetaMask for deploying a ERC-721 with like an image and a name and description. Um, but if you were, so what's interesting about this is, um, you know, you can deploy 
a ERC721 using any of these tools, and they're all like compatible with each other. So it doesn't really matter, you know, if you use OpenC to deploy it, if you use Mintbase, or if you do it yourself. And uh, for the developers, um, I'll I'll go into a little bit of code to show uh, what this would actually look like. Um, so this is. Can you pull that up? Yeah. Um, so not so. That makes sense. Um, so or, yeah, cool. Um, so this is a example uh, tradable ERC721 token. Um, a tradable ERC721 token isn't, uh, don't think of it as anything really special. Um, we just added some like utility functions. Could you them? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. So also my like uh, linter is not very happy. <laughs> um, but uh, the so you know just a simple way to mint. Um, if you go to our documentation, you'll also see some special stuff we do with pre-approving tokens for trading. Um, but uh, basically, it's just an ERC721 inherited from the Open Zeppelin ERC721 full, which has all sorts of uh, nice things associated with it. Um, it has uh, like the token URI. Um, it has like easy ways to mint, easy ways to burn, uh, all of that stuff. Um, so it's now, per, I mean. It's very simple to uh, deploy 721 even if you're not a coder, um, but even as a coder, uh, you can do it pretty easily. So I will attempt to deploy this. So, um, I won't like try to have everyone do it because I think we don't have enough time. But basically, you could create a .env file, um, <laughs> and that would sort of uh, configure all the accounts that you want to use to deploy your um, contract. Um, so it also sets up a Infura, or you, you can get an Infura key and um, inject it in there, um, and then if you run the minting script, or sorry, if you run the deployment script, so this one, then in theory, this will give you a new ERC721 uh, contract. Um, and one cool thing is that OpenC will actually pick up, it kind of like Etherscan, will pick up any new ERC721s that are deployed. Um, so once we mint our first asset on this ERC721 contract, uh, we'll automatically, it'll automatically show up on OpenSea, um, and you could go and trade it. So um, we'll wait for the contract to deploy. This is this is kind of where the uh, um, token URI uh, immutable versus not immutable data storage becomes kind of interesting. So um, this minting script I made earlier today, and um, it basically just uses some JSON storage site that I found. So if we go to this, um, I just I literally just uh, like. I just created a little bit of JSON, right? So name, hello, description, hi there, um, and then an image. And this is really good enough for the metadata standard, technically. Um, but 
you know, to the point back there, I could go and like modify this, right? So if you're trying to create an NFT that is immutably, like has an immutable image associated with it, it's always the same name, et cetera, then you'll probably want to look into something like IPFS uh, so that you know your customers can have this guarantee that, that their items won't be changed. Yeah, on that note, how, um, <clears throat> it seems like most people are using URLs yeah. for that. Um, are most like readers of NFTs configured to pull the URL, or do many of them have support for serving an IPFS hash? Yeah, so certainly like we have support for IPFS. Um, uh, there's not that many like NFT readers, they all, like most of them use our API um, because in the early days, like with CryptoKitties, there was actually no token URI standard. And so everyone just had their own like weird API, right? Like that showed data in some random way. And people still deploy ERC 721s without conforming to the metadata standard. So a lot of folks use our API, um, which is not, you know, a, a very good thing. Like we don't want to be the central point of like NFT management or whatever. Um, but, but yeah, if you were building a like open source NFT uh, aggregator, you would definitely want to support something like IPFS. Right? Um, so yeah, so am I out of time? Four minutes. Ago. So we do have our ERC seven twenty one contract. Um, we can go on rankb.etherscan and check it out, that could be that exciting. Um, and um, then we could mint some items on here. Uh, so don't worry, this like environment stuff is not, it's all just like throw away. Um, so, uh, so I'm gonna replace this address here. And then, hopefully, if I run the minting script, it'll mint some items with that uh, metadata that I showed you. And after it's done that, um, you can view an item on OpenSea if you just use a little bit of URL uh, wizardry by hitting uh, slash assets, slash address, slash token ID. Um, I think we have to wait for it to deploy. So it has minted an item. Um, so So it has minted token ID number one. And now we can go to uh, rinkab slash one, and hopefully it should show up. Yeah, so that's the image I used. Um, it was called hello. Um, and then some other interesting things you can do here are you can immediately put this on sale, um, both through the OpenSea UI or programmatically through our SDK. You can sell it in a different token. Um, on, on mainnet, we support stable coins and things like that. On testnet, we support this test token. Um, you could create sort of a Dutch auction where you started at a certain price, ended at another price. You could create a private sale, um, eBay style auction. You could bundle it together with other NFTs, um, uh, any, even from other contracts and things like that. Um, so there's all these things you can immediately do with it. Um, and you can see the history for it. So it was born a minute ago to my account. Um, and lastly, because I think I'm running out of time, uh, you can configure this. So you get a free storefront. So deployed a lot of contracts called Creature, but um, asset slash creature dash 49. Um, and you can actually edit this storefront. And what's, what's interesting here is we use the ownable owner of the contract to uh, permission who can edit their storefront. So 
if I go to edit storefront, um, I can add a uh, image for the storefront um, and description, and then um, my marketplace fees, which are basically whenever something sells, uh, I'll take a cut of those sales to a payout address, um, and then a little bit around uh, how the items are displayed. <laughs> All right. Any any last minute questions? All right. Thanks so much. Um,